and hoa hoi hoi ihiki mai keiala. Um, I'm a Hawaiian language teacher, and so for a long time I've been digging about in the, the dust of archives and microfilms, and, and uh, many of us do. There's, we're part of a movement of revitalization of the language that's been exciting, and it's always an adventure. And so we dig about, and I'm very accustomed with microfilms and dusty papers and archives and whatnot. And in the course of this, a lot of people working together on this, we've dug pieces out and we've actually made sort of an archaeological finding. Um, Foucault took the term archaeology of knowledge, but that's really what it is, is that much of what is, is part of the revitalization of culture and, and a people is actually fed and illuminated by this body of material that is coming very, very clear to us now. The piece that I'm going to address, I call it the, it's a legacy of literacy, because what comes down through families, through halau, through, through regions, through areas, the collective knowledge that's handed down is incredibly valuable. But this, there is a documentary record that's been out of our hands that's really, it's a blind spot in so many ways. And you can function around a blind spot. I have a couple of them. Um, <laughs> you can really work well. And I think that, that so many of the wonderful projects that are in motion are working well. But this is sort of the backbone, the pillar of that house that's going to make every one of those stronger if, uh, if it works. OK, but to, to be able to really understand, to be able to appreciate this, I think and this isn't a history lecture, but I think a sort of a glide through a historical frame is really important. Well, that was OK. Um, just an overview. Hawaiians get here somewhere between 300 and 1,000 AD. Continual contact starts with Cook. Kamehameha finally pulls all the islands into a single kingdom in 1810. And that is an absolute monarchy. His second son, Kamehameha III, creates a constitutional monarchy in 1840. And by that time, Hawaii is almost universally literate. This already, this incredible little kingdom is already being set aside, set, set apart from many of its peers around the world. That's a very unique setting to be in. The overthrow in 1893, a purported annexation in 1898, territory 1900 until 1959, and statehood from then until now. And a really important period, the 1960s, starts a cultural regeneration. And that leads to the language revitalization. Language was considered on the brink of language death, the Hawaiian language, in about 1970. But forces are really a grassroots movement. It's focused around the university, but it couldn't have happened without much broader range. Now has brought a whole new generation of speakers. It has developed, now there's education from toddlers to doctorates that you can do in Hawaiian language. And that's a really exciting progression. And then in the last 10 years, because a lot of that really was built with minimal tools, in the last 10 years, really there's been a renaissance of knowledge. And it's the marriage of a whole generation of new speakers of the language with the technology and awareness of how to reach for history that's starting to put historical ma material back in hand. Why, that's amazing. So, <laughs> so, but I would ask you to imagine that in your neighborhood, the whole time that you were growing up, that there was this hill. And it's known that it wasn't, a, it's man-made. It's not a natural edifice. It's man-made. And not exactly sure. It's from the time before. People have dug around in it. They found cool stuff. But it's not really certain whether it was a treasure trove or a trash heap. But it's there. But in Hawaii, we're actually really a accustomed to that, a heap of rubble that may have been there for a century or two is excavated and there's an edifice. So we're sort of familiar with that. And so that hill in the neighborhood, finally in the last 10 years, we've excavated it. And in this hill, there's a five-story library. And it's awesome. And so in the course of the last 10 years, We've been able to turn the lights on on the first floor. We've got about a one-fifth of it lit up. And we see how very important this is. And that's what I want to touch is the size of it and the depth of it. And that's what's important and where it is. This is opening up for everyone. So what it does is 
This is the internal story. This is the internal documentation of that whole period of Hawai'i's move. This is from when it was an absolute kingdom through the constitutional monarchy up almost to statehood. This is the internal dialogue. And it's even more than that, but it's, it's an incredible body of knowledge that the material that we're trying to understand today. Um, I was sitting with uh, one of the board members for the Proteca Olave, the council there, and I said, well, but have you looked at what was written other places? So we find a little quick report, 1840, remember that's when literacy was almost reaching universal literacy here. There's a note about a school report, 20 kids reporting, you know, being tested and shown and showing their prowess on the island of Kaho'olawe. Did you all know that there was a school on Kaho'olawe? Neither did I. So neither did he, as a matter of fact. That was a lovely sort of opening. Um, we just talked about the overthrow, the fact that we did a history uh, translation project last fall, six students. We translated four newspapers for a three-week span every day, every, every one of the newspapers. It was the week prior to and following the, the overthrow of Lili Uokalani, the Hawaiian language newspapers. There's no history text today that even looked at those to see what the Hawaiians were saying among themselves. So when you talk about the blind spot has been large and it's opening up, there's real hope for that. Um, but to understand that blind spot, I think we have to understand how literacy happened here, because it's different here. From the coming of Cook, Hawaiians wanted everything on that ship. They wanted the guns, the clothes, the food, the planks, the nails, everything. And, and most of it you could get. For two pigs or a little social time, you could actually get almost anything that, that you wanted. But we know, too, that they wanted, they could see this new thing. People could scratch out a paper, hand it off, and a guy on the other end of the ship knew what was up. They wanted it, but that's not as easily accessible. We know they wanted it. This is the signature of Kamehameha on the letters that were sent to King George, 18, 1793 and 1810. He wrote letters to King George III. He signed his name. He, they wanted it, but there was no consistent way to get at it. He even set up a school in 1810, um, trying to educate his, second, his first son and his nephew who would take over the kingdom. That didn't really work. It wasn't until after his death, the missionaries come the year after Kamehameha the first dies, and they set up, they're allowed to reside for the year. They are set up in the courts, and that's where the first schools are. Missionaries are learning Hawaiian language, and they're working with Hawaiians to create a system that puts it down into writing. And they create the pi a pa. The alphabet is called pi a pa, because if you take a pi and an a, you get pa. How clever. And it was so clever, and it was so close to the spoken word that a fluent speaker of his own language could learn to read and write in 18 hours. So the courts actually learned this really quite quickly. They sent people out to the rural districts. Many of the chiefs in rural districts were already learning to read and write. 1824, Ka'ahumanu, issues an edict that when the schools start, you will be there. And so pictures like this, can, they can be a little disconcerting. You know, the uh, suited foreigner standing over a, a sea of brown faces. Um, but really the important thing in this one would be that next photo. There is the lady behind him. That's Ka'ahumanu. And she's there, all there, because she said, this is important. This is the beginning of a national movement. But you'll see that many of them are carrying books. They're holding their books. And the learning to read and write was really critical. They got Christianity through reading and writing. But Hawaiians were known to be equally adept at reading right side up, upside down, and sideways. Because the interest moved so fast. It moved faster than the printing presses could go. So the guy who owned the book read right side up. And everybody else adapted. Hawaiians are notoriously, <laughs> notoriously adaptive. There would be, yeah. It's just the next year that the young second son of Kamehameha, this is Kawikioli Kamehameha III, comes and he announces, my nation will be a nation of literacy. This is incredible. The, uh, the move from the elite being educated to the whole nation being educated is really what sets Hawaii and this collection aside. So there's a teacher's college set up in 1831. The first newspapers are printed there. 
And this, from 1834, they never stopped printing Hawaiian newspapers. There's a hundred and, hundred and some different newspapers that are printed. They run for 114 years. Hawaiian newspapers are still printed in 1948. But this one sets the tone for the first 25 years. They're mostly generated by the missionary teachers of the government. They move into the public press. This becomes a commercial press in 1860. And the size of this is what sets it off. It's the size of the Wall Street Journal. And it's got four times more text than your morning newspaper hat. So this makes for an incredible amount of text. A million and a half pages is what it tallies out if it was printed out. This is the last of the newspapers, 1948. So it maintained that large size. And all of these are different mastheads from different newspapers that ran, sometimes for a year, sometimes for 10 years, one for 70 years. But they're more than a stack of valuable papers. I put my papers in the yard to keep the weeds down. Hawaiians had their newspapers bound at the end of the year because they were references. Because there had been, while there was the same way there was a national embrace on literacy, the population from the time the missionaries arrived until those first commercial presses had dropped 50% already. The sweep of loss was from the time of Cook and on. So they recognized knowledgeable people dying was like a library burning down. So the newspapers were collectively embraced as a repository of knowledge. From the earliest newspapers, they encouraged the chiefs, put the old knowledge in print so it doesn't get swept away. Kamakau, who's been mentioned here a couple of times, he, from his earliest writings, would say things like, we need this for the future generations. And when he writes later on, in the next slide, yeah, <laughs> he says, we need it accurate, because it's for the future. But this next one, in ni this is 1862, and he's saying, those of you who are knowledgeable, put it here, be it complete, because those in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, and 130 years will need to know. And, that's, and they did. They absolutely downloaded. This is a chant composed by Kamehameha I. We didn't know he was a poet. We knew he could sign his name. But he composed this, and that's important. What's more important is that someone held it in memory. This was a family treasure for 50 years, and the newspapers was the safe place for it. The one next to it is 25 years older and was the chant that presaged Kamehameha's rise to power. Thousands of these were put in the newspapers, along with whole blocks of stories, huge bodies of knowledge about practice. This just became, it became a repository. How could, it's so large, it's 114 years, it's a, hundred, a million and a half maybe pages of of material. What we have in hand, what's in all those history books, what's accessible to the people who are trying to renew practice is 2% of that is available right now. That's what's in the books. 98% of it lies there untouched. How could something that large and that important go away, become invisible, become a blind spot? It's this, basically, the move to English. The move, 1896, English becomes, by law, the language of education. So you have generation after generation who simply forgot that this was there. And whole generations that never knew that this body had even been created, intentionally created. But like heaps of rubble that we're familiar with, that turn into edifices, really, into this, we have a heap, and we've uncovered it. But it's not only what's in that library that's important, it's that that library is a it's like a spine. It is the chronological record that runs through all the manuscript material, all the family legacy material. All of that is illuminated. This was an a archive piece, um, a drawing, an old man's memory of a heiau that once was in Kona. That's actually, that heap of rubble is what they were looking at when he drew it. This is what really was there. So in the same way, this library really allows us to rebuild from a pile of rubble, or from a, to open up that blind spot in so many ways. Three-fifths, now we've got, in the last year we did an incredible project, 7,000 volunteers around the world. 2,500 of them helped type pages. By the end of this year, 76,000 of those 125,000 pages are in digital form and searchable. It's rudimentary, but it's there. Now we can start linking up ex uh, the translations that are out there. And this opens the door for all kinds of 
research for every project that's up, whether it's a history book or a fish pond, there's material here. And so the thing to do, there are places to look for it. These are websites that'll be accessible. It's the raw material, but you gotta start with raw material. But we've at least, we've got a library. It's there. What we do with it is what's to be excited about. Thank you very much. Thank you.